and good evening one and all uh, thank you for joining us today and today is the second day of our uh, global youth summit and yesterday we had nearly 13 uh, speakers uh, from around the globe and that was a really wonderful section uh, because we got a different knowledge uh, from different people uh, across the world and today uh, Stephen is here with us to speak uh, about his concern on environment and climate change and welcome Stephen um, yeah, and you can start your session now Stephen Hi everyone my name is Steven Owiti, a youth advocate affiliated to AMREP Health Africa. And I'm so much very glad to have been given this opportunity to speak about environmental pollution. Now, with your permission, allow me to echo Jen Goodall's uh, message of hope that every individual can make a difference and if we continue to leave decision making to the so-called decision makers things will never change and therefore i absolutely share the view and thoughts of uh, uh, the so-called legend naturalist jane, jane goodall uh, it is very prudent that change can start small and that everybody can do something what am i hoping to achieve at the end of this presentation. Today, I hope we'll get a clear definition of what is environmental pollution and probably the causes and the effects. More importantly, the remedy to the environmental pollution. So today I'm very much honored and very glad to speak about environmental pollution, which is not a new phenomenon, yet it remains a very uh, you know, the world's greatest menace facing humanity. It is worth mentioning that every person on our home planet is affected by a worldwide swamp of man-made chemicals and pollutants, uh, which have never been tested for safety. Again, they play a very major role in the imbalance of the environment. The climate change and the climate crisis and the global warming that we are witnessing is because of pollution. So today, I want to affirm that there are four major types of pollution, and that is air, water, soil, and noise. Now, according to the World Bank Group, pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death. And statistics have it that pollution causes more than 11 million premature deaths. All these types of pollution have devastating effects. I'll give an example of water pollution, which has led to diseases in children and unwanted substances dumped on land or chemical fertilizers used or for agricultural purposes causes soil pollution. Lastly, uh, on air pollution, there has been a lot of environmental risk to health, including uh, teenage kids developing various respiratory diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, it is evident that pollution is causing more harm on the environment, on human health, microorganisms, and therefore I feel it is the essential need of the hour to take serious steps to reduce pollution to its core. Today, I want to uh, encourage the organizers of this event that they keep up with the good work because they have given young people uh, this generation an avenue to raise the voice for nature i want to bring to the global audience that here in kenya statistics have it that we have lost our very beautiful animals including elephants here at Savo National Park, more than 100 due to the effects of drought. It is disheartening and it is painful, even though we are very much glad to have heard that the ministry is doing something about it. But it is so clear and profound that the climate crisis is here with us. So I feel that uh, above all, I have all the confid confidence in the world that as young people, we need to make our voices heard 
and to make sure that the people in power cannot continue to ignore this. Finally, I would want to give my special thanks uh, to the Eco Foundation for giving us as young people the platform to raise our voice for nature. Today, I want to say that this is our future and this is our responsibility. Let us prioritize nature. Let us prioritize nature. Let us prioritize nature. The only way that we can save the planet is if everyone who has a who is concerned about climate change will take a political action, for example, by voting, by protesting, campaigning for climate change. We have already seen this in the global uh, north where the greater effect is taking a very, very greater course. That is the right trajectory. Action, 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 action. We as empathetic people, we need to act so that we can move others okay. without just being ignored, misunderstood, okay. or mocked. So I would say that we need to chart our youth vision for a just and sustainable future. And in this case, finally, I would like to say that it is still a great opportunity for us to um, make sure that we capture our voices around these key environmental issues. Otherwise, from me, once again, my name is Stephen Owiti, and I'm a change maker. Thank you so much, and I'm glad to be part of this uh, Global uh, Youth Summit. Thank you. And thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us from Kenya. And uh, it was really inspiring uh, to hear from your side, uh, your thoughts and concerns on environment. And next, I would like to call uh, Mr. Kevin from India. Uh, Kevin, uh, I think you are ready to uh, speak. Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, Mr. Kevin, you are audible. Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay. First, to talk about this opportunity, and uh, the topic which I am going to bring is. Stage is about uh, groundwater. So, as we all know, the most resources are but still, uh, there is like a uh, available for available for everyone. Uh, depends on uh, you know, uh, for for example. Uh, the world availability of fresh water is like a, the total and the total if we consider like a hundred percentage of water only three percentage of our earth's water is like a fresh water and uh, those three in that three percent most of them are available as glaciers which are frozen and uh, about like a 0.5 percentage of water is only accessible to mankind uh, this through like a uh, slate and uh, the topic which I am going to discuss here is about groundwater. Since uh, I am a research scholar from Department of Biology Anna University, uh, who is currently working on uh, groundwater quality and resources. So, yeah, um, what is groundwater? Uh, groundwater is nothing but uh, the water which gets entrapped into our aquifers, and uh, it can be like uh, extracted for uh, various purposes, like uh, domestic purposes, industrial usages, etc. And uh, yeah, groundwater plays a major role for uh, in the availability of fresh water to uh, the mankind and all life forms. But in certain regions, like uh, um, I would like to like explain, uh, keep an example of India. Water, the basic like water, food, and air. These are the three things that cannot be like uh, demonetized. That cannot be like uh, made into money because. Air, water, and food is like everyone's right. But for the, the past recent decade, the com uh, water has become commercialized, and we all knew that uh, not right to what, and because so. Um, uh, as you know, as uh, I am from a place called as Chennai from Tamil Nadu. 
uh, which is a, like a coastal uh, city it it depends mostly on uh, coastal aquifers which is uh, a major source of uh, groundwater there and uh, uh, due to the like, over extraction of uh, groundwater in those regions by both domestic and for industrial purposes the actual groundwater level uh, of those areas actually have fallen uh, fallen like great uh, great at great depth and uh, if you see uh, the papers which was uh, released by my fellow uh, scholar my respected professors they have identified in a place in chennai which about like a place called north chennai the water level has gone Three kilometers inside the coast, like if I went three kilometers inside, and saline water is found to be intruded. So there are some major places which was severely hit by saline water intrusion. And uh, as far as my concern, uh, uh, and uh, recently we celebrated our uh, World Water Day. So the theme for that Water Day is like. making the invisible groundwater visible that was a theme for that world water day and uh, what I, what time to the groundwater has already made visible in most of our countries but it's time for us to like uh, regulate and uh, conserve our uh, precious uh, water resource because uh, uh, there is a high chance that uh, the future in future we might have a world war 3 for the countries who are like availability of water we may actually get a war so it is like really important and essential to save and preserve our water and make sure that every each and every kid and kin of our world citizens may get the sources fresh water free so thank you all brothers and sisters and uh, cheers and thank you so much kevin balaji uh, to joining us from india and uh, you are discussing about the importance of the water actually water is very essential for the existence of life on the planet earth and especially the fresh water for the human being yes nowadays the uh, ex- fresh water is exploiting as well as the polluting a lot and thank you for your comment on uh, that topic and now i would like to invite uh, sushmita hoshal from uh, india again and i think she is ready right Ah, uh, you are not audible. We can't hear you, ma'am. Ah, uh, no. Now, can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you. Ah, <clears throat> uh, good evening to all the luminaries across the globe. Ah, uh, and I would like to show my heartfelt gratitude and my. uh heartfelt wishes to all the uh members of eco foundation for giving me this opportunity to be heard and as to speak for the rising issues of uh, global climate crisis and uh, without wasting a minute i would like to address my report which is on climate loss environmental damage and its consequences in recent era so it is basically an oral presentation and now i will start in recent decades climate issues along with environmental damage have been addressed for a plethora of times other than anything human caused climate change irreplaceable loss of environmental particles distinction of animals ever increasing damage of human ecosystems and the indication of degenerating nature are making headlines day by day scaling down the emissions and mitigation through several meetings summits conferences arranged by many world uh, organizations uh, and uh, of course united nations can help <clears throat> in building a firm solution for the long run but it is unavoidable to face the consequences of crucial alert situations for our forests oceans mountains and others and all the things which are forming our nature and the intensifying heavy rainfall the melting of snow cover sea ice in antarctica habitat change of a large range of 
plants animals etc are being one of the main concerns for the alarming situation these days the world's weather systems have been badly affected since the last century and it is a prominent evidence for continuous floods cyclones typhoons hurricanes droughts earthquakes and many more natural calamities across the globe <clears throat> due to the higher rate of gaj emission the air layers of earth have been their worst in their worst condition as the ozone layer has severely pierced and caused the most harmful rays to enter according to the annual climate report of uh, national centers for environmental information below are the following points we need to focus on a urgent basis earth's temperature has risen by 0.14 degree fahrenheit per decade since 18 80 and the rate of warming over the past 40 years in more than twice that 0.32 degree per decade since 1981 2020 was the second warmest year on record based on noaa's temperature data and land areas were record warm average across land and ocean the 2020 2020 year surface temperature was 1.76 degree fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century average of 57.0 degree fahrenheit and warmer than the pre industrial period which was in 1882-1900 despite a late year la nina event that cooled a white swath of the tropical pacific ocean 2020 came just 0.04 degree fahrenheit shy of tying 2016 for warmest year on record the 10 warmest years on record have occurred since 2005 and from 1900 to 1980 a new temperature record was set on average every 13 years from 1981 to 2019 a new record was set in every 3 years so we can see how rapidly our weather has changed and the cases of rising of temperature so now i would like to tell about the heat capacity of the global oceans which might seem very tiny according to the rise of temperature but it can bring huge changes that we can never ever want in nightmares the one or two degree increase in global average surface temperature has occurred in the pre industrial area might not seem like a serious reason to ponder but it caused severe damage and now it has all gone from our hands the north and the south extremities are highly responsible to maintain the balancing of weather reports across the entire globe and slowly it is visible in many environmental or weather surveys and reports that the imbalanced nature of those regions are causing the glaciers to turn into water and increase the water level to the arctic sea now let's talk about the health how it has how global warming climate change and environment laws has affected our health since the previous decades till now due to the severe extreme heat events and deteriorating quality of air in huge parts of the world we have been prone and highly affected with chronic health diseases like skin disease breathing issues like asthma mental health retro gradation directly interconnected with the change of food habits and low nutritious food ingredients heat stroke dehydration as well as cardiovascular diseases respiratory diseases gastrointestinal illness like diarrhea effects on the body's nervous and respiratory okay. systems or kidney or liver damage etc and many more serious health consequences the unprecedented and unanticipated health issues are getting into the notice as some of the health occurrences in many places or times which previously didn't occur 
people irrespective of their age groups income status and living situations are being affected for the ever changing climate crisis the current global recession caused by covid-19 may make the situations more conflicted and narrowed for the situations of mitigation it but it also opens the path for the golden opportunities of a greener environment and gives us the hints to handle environment related issues in a more sensible and delicate way adaptation policies aimed at enhancing resilience to a changing climate such as investing in disaster proof infrastructure and early warning systems risk risk sharing through financial markets and the development of social safety nets can limit the impact of weather related shocks and help the economy recover faster so this was my report thank you so much for patiently listening to my report and thank you ecor foundation for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my environmental report before uh, different luminaries along the way thank you so much okay thank you so much uh, thank you so much for joining us from india as well as giving your uh, study report to us and it was really wonderful and i think uh, you give some uh, the predicted uh, predictions and what will happen in the future if we uh, stay tuned on uh, the uh, the bad thing which we are doing and um, what will happen to the uh, human being and what will happen uh, the climate change to our daily life and to the health as well okay thank you so much uh, for your uh, insightful uh, thoughts and uh, your talk it was really wonderful thank you so much ma'am and next uh, i would like to call uh, samira from kenya i think she is ready to uh, speak uh, with us samira Uh, uh hello, hello samira we can't hear uh, you now my acknowledgement uh, yes okay uh, right now it is fine thank you we can continue okay may I begin by acknowledging the privilege and honor that i feel right now to be given this opportunity to be part of this event uh, i would love to introduce myself i am leila achieng um um i'm currently a student at Kenyatta University and are going a bachelor of architectural studies in my first year um, having introduced myself allow me to have an open discussion with you on how us the naturally empowered human beings can have a say in controlling factors that affect the environment of this planet our home in which we live in um, my theme of discussion is environmental ma management which i will simply describe as a plan to make sure that our environment remains in the purest form uh, as it was many years ago we are all aware of the human activities that affect the environment such as dumping of free food without designating a specific location this is especially in the urban areas around the world as we know uh, the urban areas have a high population, meaning a high a high production of refuge, a high production of garbage each year. The manufacture and use of substances such as plastic that do not decompose even with time is still not discouraged in most parts of the country. But I am happy to I'm happy to to know that Kenya does not does does not use plastic bags anymore. Um, the danger of this all is in our slum areas where they are greatly affected as the planning of the area fails of, of the area fails to allow the collection of garbage. I think the most of the slum areas in uh, parts of Africa and the world that they do not have uh, a slum development where garbage will be picked and uh, they'll they'll be picked. So like you find these bad sanitation there, which affects the environment and the people living around there. You find like they have they they have diseases. Most of them, especially in the I'll say in Kenya, there's the Dandora Dam site where all the collections of garbage from Nairobi in the, in the Nairobi city, it's it's been it's been blessed there. So you find the people around there have cancer, the lung cancers, which affect them. Uh, all of all of 
all of these activities, they cause adversity, be it stench, excessive dust in the atmosphere, excessive presence of noise, floods and droughts. We can recite many ways through which human activities do affect the purity of our Earth planet. But the fact is, we need to wake up and start to plan how to save our planet Earth in good time before it is too late. My hope is that the Sustainable Development Goal, number six, to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sa sanitation for all is put into action soon, especially in the slum areas that I have said. And thus, I talk of the Environmental Management Plan, a responsibility that should not be left to the rest of the government and other organizations only, but it should be our collective responsibility as humans. Let's choose to be a hero of our home as we have choices to make, which are either to be the villain of the planet or its hero. By that, I choose to be a voice, a hero of the, of the environment. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much uh, for your comments on the theme environment and climate change. Thank you. And I would like to call the another number, number just number 31. And Abida, I think uh, it's Abida from Indonesia. Hello. Are you there? Hello. Uh, yes. Yes, please. Uh, does my presentation is visible? Uh, yes, it is visible. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is S. Abi Dabidawasiwi. You can call me Abi. I'm from Indonesia and I work as junior statistician analyst for Statistics Indonesia in yeah. the office in East Nusa Tenggara. Things. In this occasion, I would like to share with you about implementation and mine findings of timber accounts on system of environmental economic accounting in Indonesia for a period of 2016-2020 by Statistics Indonesia. Indonesia is an archipelago nation that comprises more than 17,000 islands, about 6,000 are inhabited. Straddling Equator, the archipelago is a crossroad between two oceans, Pacific and Indian Ocean, and bridge two continents, which is Asia and Australia. Conservation International considers Indonesia to be one of the 17 mega diverse countries. When we take a look at forests of Indonesia, the cover area in 2020 is more than 95 million hectares. The largest forest area is in Papua, about 18% of total forest area. Forests have many functions and roles. Two of them are ecological functions and economic function. In the ecological role, it is a habitat for wildlife, recreational place, global cycle of water, oxygen, carbon and nitrogen, as well as slowly absorb hold and release the water cycle, thereby reducing erosion and flooding. In the economic role, forest is a resource that has the potential to create goods, services, and economic activities that are beneficial to society and people surrounding it. In terms of forest utilization and management in our modern time, it is necessary to create a plan based, based on cutting edge methodology that can produce comprehensive data and information. One of approach to do that is using assets accounts for timber research, which is part of system of environmental econ economic accounting framework. It is a measurement framework that could present a variety of indicators connecting information on the economy and the environment. System of environmental economic accounting or SEEA was adapted by the United Nations Statistical Commission as an international statistical guideline. As an international statistical guideline, the current position of the SEEA 
is equal with system of national account. The development of the SEEA framework is driven by the desire to present complete and comprehensive information on the economy and environment and to provide a better understanding of its interaction. In the next slides, I would like to share the main findings for timber accounts in Indonesia. Timber accounts is only one chapter of the publication. You can download full publication by the link on the slide. Asset accounts for timber resource records the volume and monetary value of all timber resource at the beginning and end of the accounting period and the change of stock over the accounting period for the nation. The basic asset account is presented in cub cubic meters while the monetary asset accounts is presented in rupiah. Due to the time limitation, this presentation will cover physical assets account only. During the 2016 and 2020 period, the physical volume for the crossing stock of thick timber of Java has increased every year. This increase is due to the physical volume of growth and reclassification which is reforestation and planting for thick timber of Java, which is greater than the removals, losses, and reclassification. In five years, thick timber of Java has increased by more than 12 million meter cubic, or increased by about 11% compared to 2016. At the end of the 2020, the physical volume of thick timber of Java is 130 million 31 million meter cubic. This has a positive impact on the preservation of Java thick forest. Estimated age of reserve for thick timber of Java at the end of 2020 reached 303 years with a removal average is 433,000 meter cubic annually. In the same period, the physical volume for the closing stock of other timber of Java also increased every year. The increase in physical volume is due to the physical volume of growth and reclassification, which is reforestation and planting. For other timber of Java, is greater than removals, losses, and reclassification. During this period, the physical volume for the closing stock of other timber of Java in 2020 has increased by about 34 million meter cubic, or increased by 7% compared, compared to 2016. Thus, it has an impact of increasing the physical volume for other timber of Java during five years period. At the end of 2020, the physical volume for other timber of Java is about half billion meter cubic. Estimated age reserve for other timber of Java reaches 1307 years with a removal average is 413000 meter cubic annually in contrast to thick timber of java and other timber of java during the last five years the physical volume for the closing stock of other timber outside of java actually decreased every year during this period the physical volume for the closing stock of other timber outside of Java in 2020 has decreased by more than half billion meter cubic compared to 2016. At the end of the 2020, the physical volume for the closing stock of other timber outside of Java is 3.3 billion meter cubic. The estimated age of reserve for other timber outside of Java in 2020 which 66 years with a removal average is 51 million meter cubic annually. When we feed in the details, the cause of the decreasing in the physical volume for other timber offset of Java is due to the volume of losses and the classification, as well as removal for other timber offset of Java during the period of 2016-2020 is high and not offset by the increasing in volume of growth and reclassification, which is reforestation and planting, especially in 2019. This is because in that year, there were quite extensive forest fires. Certainly, this needs to be watched out and act on 
so that the sustainability of other forests outside of Java is maintained. Here are the summary of physical volume for timber resource of Indonesia. The physical assets account for timber resource of Indonesia is the sum of the physical assets account for three commodities, which is thick timber of Java, other timber of Java, and other timber outside of Java. The physical, physically, the closing stock for timber resources of Indonesia shows a downtrend over 2016-2020 period. By the end of 2020, the physical volume of closing stock for timber resource of Indonesia has decreased by about 613 million meter cubic or equal to 13% compared to the volume of the closing stock in 2016. At the end of 2020, the physical volume for closing stocks for timber resources of Indonesia is about 4 billion meter cubic. The estimated age of reserve for timber resources of Indonesia at the end of 2020 reaches 78 years with a removal average of 52 million meter cubic annually. The cause of decre decreasing in the physical volume of the closing stock for timber resources of Indonesia is due to the decreasing in the physical volume of the closing stock for other timber outside of Java, which has the largest contribution to the national physical volume, or about 85%. During the period of 2016 and 2020, the contribution for the commodity of other timber outside of Java shows a decreasing trend. Although the importance of the role of forests and efforts to achieve sustainable forest management has been recognized, Indonesia's forest has experienced degradation. In the short term, it is estimated that it is still difficult to overcome because the effects made to improve will catch up with the degradation that has occurred. The conclusion, forest is a natural resource that is renewable, but on this utilization and the management, must consider the balance and preservation of ecosystem. Environmental management will ensure the continuity of the functions and roles of forest resources in the long term. As a mega biodiversity country, the application assets accounts for timber resource and larger environmental economic accounting system as a whole framework in Indonesia should be continued, improved, and its funding disseminated. Thank you so much. Have because it can provide complete and comprehensive economic and environmental assets. information and provide a better understanding of their interaction. I would like to close this presentation by reading excerpt from the stick list commission in its report beyond GDP. What we measure influence what we do, and if the results of our measurement contain flaws, the decisions based on them may be distorted. The choice between increasing okay. GDP and protecting the environment could be the wrong choice when environmental degradation has been properly included in the calculation of our economic performance. Likewise, when we often concluded a good policy by seeing whether the policies drive economic growth, but, it, but if what we measure contains weakness, then the conclusions we draw might also be wrong. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. I'll give you back to the moderator. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Abida, uh, for joining us from Indonesia, and uh, you give it um, give, give the statistical data of the timber uh, consumptions in uh, your country. And as you know, timber is very important for the human being from um, using as a fuel to a uh, construction material and uh, anyway that was really a good presentation and it gave a lot of statistical data about the timber consumption in your country thank you and i would like to call upon uh vincent i think uh, vincent is there and vincent is ready uh, from in uh, kenya vincent are you there yes i am there and i'm very much ready yeah. yes please vincent so yeah, so um, uh, Vincent, once again, wall, then, I uh, think uh, your camera is bit and we can't see your face in clear way. Like, 
Okay, it's not that car. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, now it is now. Fine. Okay. Yes, now it is good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I wish uh, to thank the Eco Foundation for this um, chance for this platform to present and discuss on the matters of environmental changes that are currently happening across the globe. Actual environment is not a local thing now, but it's a thing that uh, covers, I mean, the whole world. So let me start by the presentation. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, a minute. All right, a minute. Okay, even as it is, uh, is it now? Are you seeing my presentation? Uh, yes, I think you are just going to take your uh, slides, right? Yeah, your screen is visible for us. So you can see my slides, eh? Uh, yes. Thank you. All right, so let yeah. me start right away. Yeah. So that is the my introduction. My name is Kipkiri Vincent. I am the program officer in charge of an organization by the name Transfer Green World, which is here in Kenya, a place called Kericho Rift Valley uh, province. So Transfer Green World, uh, what we do, are aimed at transforming lives for the better society. So today, uh, let me talk about climate change and wetlands. And I wish to start by saying the following. First of all, the facts are very stubborn. It is now common knowledge, it is in public domain, that climate change is now happening at a faster rate. So if that is not contained, it's going to wreak havoc to humanity and to everything we have in the environment. It's indeed true that our planet is getting hotter. Why? Because of the greenhouse gases, which of course contributes in a big way to climate change. So climate change uh, can be visible or they can be seen through the loss of many rainforests right here in Africa, and even in our country. Across the globe, we have the ice, which is massively melting at quite a faster rate and filling our oceans. And soon, our coastal cities may be disappearing. So these, uh, these, uh, these uh, effects or these uh, of climate change are actually accelerated by man. The main driver is the man. So among the causes is uh, there is continued use of fossil fuel. So be it in the cars, be it in factories, be it uh, when traveling, be it when trying to, let, let's say um, you are trying to process anything or uh, trying to grind some food or anything. So in most cases we use fossil fuels, such as the coal, the oil, natural gas. And when these uh, fossil fuels are burned, they produce carbon dioxide, which is one of the main greenhouse gases uh, from, from, from these uh, fossil fuels. So most ecosystems which uh, serve as the greenhouse gases sinks, such as the forest ecosystems, clusters ecosystems, and specifically aquatic ecosystems, which we gotta deal with, have been exploited and unsustainably. Uh, I can attribute this to ignorance. Maybe some people don't know that uh, what they are doing is wrong, but some know. And they, it's very sad to know that uh, they are not even willing to take the responsibility of conserving the environment, or they don't even want to listen to anything about uh, conserving these uh, specific uh, wetland ecosystems. So such unsustainable exploitation has uh, hampered the ability to regenerate and therefore the integrity of ecological entropy has not been realized. So among the, th those are among the few causes of climate change. And now let me move to the effects of climate change. Everybody here can attest that climate change is already there. And the most common ones in our region, that is Africa and my country, is prolonged drought. Currently, most of our counties, around 23 counties, are having prolonged drought. This has a brought and told suffering. Uh, crops have not been able to do well. Animals have, been, uh, have not been able to survive. They have died. And these had, have uh, uh, created a huge toll even on man. Also, we have massive crop failure. Why? Because of the rising temperatures, the prolonged drought also means crops are not able to survive. Another thing is loss of plant and animal species owing to an influx of invasive species. Uh, uh, earlier, my colleague had um, said something about the loss of animal species. That is actually happening. Some plants are disappearing. Why? Because 
most parts of Kenya have a cold uh, weather and therefore with the rising temperatures, they can't be able to survive. Also, we have uh, new pets. Recently, as a country, we were battling locust, which we are told they were from Yemen. Why? Because the climate is currently becoming warm. And therefore, these uh, pests are finding it a very good environment to come and thrive in Kenya. And indeed, also, uh, they have they, they brought they also wrecked havoc on um, the they I mean they destroyed the crops and the grasses and again they had an impact on the life of a man as they affected the animals and the food from crops which uh, we we plant. So uh, with the aforementioned uh, causes and effects being evident, we now as the organization, the Transform Green Organization, whereby we aim to transform the life of a human being of everyone, have brought and implemented the following interventions. Number one, we have planted more than a million trees. These trees have been planted in forest. We have a, a, here we have a, a big forest by the name of complex, which is uh, of international uh, significance. We, are, we, we have been allocated some section of hectares and we have planted more than a million trees. So they will aid even in trying to, even in becoming the carbon sinks and control climate change. Also, we have built capacity. We have carried out massive environmental awareness that is among the people in the society, among the schools, among the various stakeholders on the reasons as to why we have to curb this climate change before they affect our life in a way that even could be irreversible. We have also uh, done what we call massive advocacy, wetland conservation. Every time we are in forums, be it making public policies, be it public participations, we always try to tell people to conserve the wetlands. Why? Because wetlands have many functions. One of them is their, their biological kidneys. I mean, they clean the water which we drink. Another one, the significant one is wetlands serve as carbon sinks. Carbon sink. Uh, from the Ramsar Conservation of uh, Environment, from the Ramsar, sorry, from the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, it is estimated that wetlands store a third of carbon, carbon dioxide in the air. That, that one means they are of high significance when it comes to matters of climate change. So these things we are doing, we are doing here locally because we believe that the global problems actually need uh, the local solutions. Therefore, we have a call to many stakeholders. Now that we are networking, finding new friends and new partners from these uh, conference, this is my eyes to all the stakeholders. The first thing we have to do is to collaborate. We have to collaborate to get synergistic results. Results that will be that will be of high impact and that will be able to deliver and save our environment. Even uh, as we try to deliver on a sustainable development goal of life below water, life above water and climate change and also clean water and sanitation. Another thing, I know many governments have laws and policies which are currently gathering dust in the shelves. We should call upon these relevant institutions to carry out the implementation so that the fight against climate change is boosted. Another thing, I know in our various countries, in Africa, in the whole globe, there are quite a number of ecosystems which are very crucial. These ecosystems, such as wetlands, forest ecosystems, even the ocean ecosystems, serve by in controlling climate change because they are the things. They sequester carbon. So let us hide the government to gazette them so that they can be protected the areas and they'll be able to perform very well. So let me share some of the projects which we as the organization have successfully executed. Number one is the Bamboo for Everywood project. So here we were selling the idea of bamboo to the people. Many people bought it and I'm glad because this bamboo, it is improving the livelihood. They are also known to be good uh, climate change controllers. I mean, they are good carbon, uh, carbon dioxide sinks and therefore can be able to absorb, absorb carbon dioxide from the air. Another thing is school revenue projects. What we do also in our county, Carisho, we partner with schools. We partner with schools in planting trees. We teach them, we ask them to give us space so that we can plant trees for the sake of increasing the forest cover, the tree cover, so that uh, climate uh, curbing is efficient. Finally, we have done what we call environmental paralegalism by VIDA. This is whereby we offer free legal advice to the people, especially those affected by the climate change. And this also has the results as the complaints or the, the complaints 
or the cases which we noted will be were addressed and uh, people actually uh, were able uh, to get the environmental justice. Uh, last, but not, uh, last but not least, when I conclude, everyone here, it's our noble duty to protect our mother nature. Because from the mother nature, we get everything. I wish now to conclude by the words of Barack Obama while in Glasgow conference, whereby he said, let's get to work. So everybody, let's get to work to conserve the environment. So for now, thank you for listening to me, and I beg uh, to end my presentation right here. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Vincent, uh, for uh, for the talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I would like to call uh, Nikin from Nikin Agustin from Indonesia. And Nikin, are you ready? Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, I'm ready. Actually, I this is I'm audible now. Ah, uh, yes, you are audible. Yes, okay, yeah. I will share my screen first. Yep, please go ahead. Okay, uh, this is already shown. Hello? Uh, uh, yes, yes, it is. Okay, hello everyone. Actually, I'm Mikan Adelia Agustin. I'm currently student at President University in Indonesia. Here, I will present about sustainable fashion. As we know that, uh, yeah, I will... Uh, do you know, uh, this is one of the picture of one of the Indonesian heritage. Do you know about Batik? Batik is one of the Indonesian heritage. That's actually, this is quite well known in Indonesia and in also in all of the world uh, it is already uh, like acknowledged by yeah. UNESCO heritage and like this beautiful woman this is what actually beautiful right but do you know that this is actually have the hidden dark side of this batik industry this is one of the picture that's uh, from Pekalongan Indonesia actually I'm is Pekalongan um, residents that I was born in Pekalongan and one of the, my concern in, when I was child is I always go to the river with the darkest of the water inside of that and that river is kind of what uh, make me heartbreaking like because I cannot see even if in a day to day of our like my life is always changing that's we work colors and here even this is one of the cute um child actually this is the flood that already happened in 2021 and yeah you can see this is like a little bit beautiful right but actually this is come from the batik bay that wow. littering the pakalongan river and then that's floating around of the village in that location in uh, this is in Panjang Regency in my hometown, Pekalongan. And then, yeah, uh, the fact is fast fashion industry is the biggest industry, which is almost some of the country uh, have the GDP from the fashion industry, like Indonesia, India, and some of the another country that depending their GDP is income from the fashion industry itself and as we know that this is the market size of the fashion industry is more than 1 trillion since 2013 and it is also represent nearly 2% of the world GDP average as I have mentioned before and for the 75% of the world fashion also market concentrated is you uh, Europe and USA, China and Japan. So here, what do you think about this? This is one of the another side, the, another dark side of the fashion industry. You can see this is like the sea that covering by the fashion waste. Fashion waste is also one of the most uh, kind of a big problems in some of the woods but have you ever realized that 
actually over 17 million tons of textile is already dumped. Then here, have you ever know that you already check your cabinet or even you still confused and you want to buy fashion again, again and again? Actually, this one of the something that us, I just want to invite all of you here to realize just think a bit for this kind of your clothes and realizing how much your clothes that you already buy and you, how much you're spending your money in that, but you're not, uh, I'll not use your clothes and just end up and settling down on your cabinet. And you know, actually the average of, of uh, the cons all, almost consume and buy 60% of the more clothing. I mean, yeah, maybe you one of them or me maybe because the, because I realized that uh, how much important of the sustainable fashion is this. I do one of the people that always buying clothes again and again. Then yeah so this problem is we should be tackling of of course so what should we do this is i already state some of the like strategical thing especially like maybe as on summer what should we do to make the fashion is small and sustainable and less dangerous for environment so the first thing is Uh, we shouldn't buy a clothes. I mean, when that's only a cheap clothes and only following the trend. And the next is uh, we should look at the certification of global label for sustainable brand to make sure that you buy the sustainable clothes. But if you cannot do that, you just be uh, kind of using another strategy to buy the second hand okay. and the next is for the brand you should ask first their supply chain for the transparency because some of the kind of brand also not quite transparent about their supply chains to make their fashion so maybe some of the sustainable uh, side is kind of just green marketing strategy to make their brand is well known by neither and for the next is for the supply um for yeah this is as i already mentioned before you should donate the purpose of sell your use uh clothes and purchase the second hand if you cannot buy the fashion brand sustainable fashion brand that maybe is quite uh, or more expensive than the ordinary and yeah for the next is uh, for the option if you are as the production production of the textile uh, so you should they have some of the option to make it more sustainable the first is for the sustainable material itself that's how you have a choice to make it uh, from recycled polyester linen or organic cotton and or with uh, prime cotton and Another thing is to hot the supply chain. As we know that some of the fabric, um, such as in Bakalongan, there are a lot of the concerns such as I mentioned for the dyeing uh, processes, which is that's only down to the water. We don't even uh, like have a processing waste, dyeing waste before. So maybe uh, if you are going to want to ha have this sustainable plane you should considering that and for the shipping itself you should also considering the how the packaging sustainable pa packaging eco-friendly packaging and for the efficiency itself is uh, you should be considering about how the energy it's come from some of the sustainable plane using the renewable energy for the their efficiency of using or hiring some of the efficiency energy manager to make it more efficient to using uh, their energy usage 
for the next is for the durability and quality and timeless design uh, you should be like if you want to build a sustainable dream you should consider also the durability and quality of your uh, clothes that you make okay uh, i think that's all for my presentation i just want to invite you to more aware because we as a human is kind of separated with fashion if your body is coverage by clothes of course right but yeah that's just like my this is just my thought that maybe uh almost all of you here also already know about this sustainable fashion i just want to give attention i mean one to make you all of remind me uh, remind you again about this kind of heartbreaking side of fashion industry and maybe you will be one of uh, that participant that can change in this uh, the fashion industry itself thank you uh, uh, thank you so much again uh, for joining us uh, from indonesia and uh, give your opinion on uh the sustainable conceptions of uh, conceptions of the cloth materials and anyway uh, right now the young generations is uh, running behind the fashion and uh, thank you for your knowledge on how to cons consume the sustainable uh, clothing or sustainable fashion and maybe we can follow this uh, to reduce the burden on the planet earth and next one i would like to call upon uh, rana uh, rana from kenya please Okay. Uh, yes, we can see your slides. Yes, we can see your, see your slides. Your slides. Not slide, actually, we just see slide, your screen. Just screen. Screen. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Michelle. So there is a problem in my side. Let me try. Let me try again. Uh, hello, Rana. Right now we can uh, hello, see your right screen. Can, uh, can you take the slides? Can you take the slides? Hello. Yeah, please go to the slides now. Yeah, please go to the slides. We can uh, see your screen. We can anyway. uh, see your screen anyway. Please open your slide in your Please mobile, and we can see that. Okay, okay. Let me, let me, let me. You can call uh, another person as I prefer. I think there is a some technical issue with my with my screen. Is it, you can call someone who was follow me as I prepare for my my screen. Uh, then actually we can see. Uh, then actually we can see your slides. You can give the next person as I prepare. Uh, okay then. Uh, okay then. Yeah. Uh, hello, Mary. Is she available there? Mary. Hello. Hello. 
Miss Mary? Yes. Yes. Uh, if you are, uh, if you can talk now, then it will be good. Can you? Yeah, I can. Yes, please. Okay, I'll be speaking about biodiversity. Uh, in align uh, okay. with the biodiversity theme today, building a shared future for all for all life. Okay, we start by saying what is biodiversity. This is the existence of number of different species of plants and animals in an environment. When we go to the de formal definition that was defined at the Convention of Biology Diversity, it gives it says biological diversity is a variability among the living organism from all sources, including the entire terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystem and ecosystem and the ecological complex of which they are part. This includes diversity within species, between species and of ecosystem. Let's speak about ecosystem diversity. It is the diversity of ecosystem, natural communities and its habitats. What of the species diversity? It's the variety of different species of plants, animals, fungi, and organisms that are present in a legion. Okay, it is estimated that there are about 30 million species on Earth. At present, conservation scientists have been able to identify and categorize about 1.8 million species on Earth. So we come and speak, what are the significance of biodiversity? Biodiversity is essential for maintaining the water cycles production of oxygen, reduction in carbon dioxide, protecting the soil, and many more. Biodiversity has many values such as consumptive use value, product, productive use value, social values, ethical and moral values. Then we come towards and say, let's look like for the productive use value of biodiversity. What does it refer to? It refers to the commercial value of products that are commercially harvested for exchange in the formal market. The modern civilization is inevitably a gift of biodiversity. The agriculture crops of the present days have originated from wide varieties. Biotechnicianists, technologists, sorry, use the wild plant for developing new high yielding and pest diseases, resistant varieties. Biodiversity is the home to original stocks from which new varieties are being developed. Similarly, all our domesticated animals come from their wild living ancestral species. Fossils fuel considered to be pivotal in modern society, such as coal, Petroleum and natural gas are a gift of biodiversity from the geographical past. Most of the pharmaceutical drugs and medicines used in the present times are extracted from different plant species. New crops, new crops variety are being developed using the genetic material found in yes. the wild relatively of crops plants through biotechnology. In the world, we have some biodiversity hotspots. There are over a thousand major eco regions in the world. It is estimated that there are about 200 richest, rarest, and most dis distinctive natural areas in the world. These are referred to as the Global 200. The hotspots are threatened with mindless exploitation and destruction. A biodiversity is termed as a hotspot if it has at least 1,500 vascular plants as endemic. Two, it must be threatened or under threat of destruction to a considerable extent. Across the world, about 35 areas are marked as hotspots of biodiversity, and they present 2.3% of the Earth's land endemic plants species, and also half of birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians as endemic. 
What are the threats facing biodiversity in the world in today? Biodiversity is a paramount factor that for the survival of the living world, the general and mankind in particular, the first species, animal and plants we have, the fewer people we will have on Earth. The last, the last few decades, loss of biodiversity is on loss. Okay, we have the major causes of biodiversity threats. One, the habitat loss. Man has begun to overuse or misuse most of these natural ecosystem due to the mindless and unsuitable results used once productive forests and grasslands have turned into deserts and wastelands have increased all over the world. Rapid industrialization, urbanization, and growth in population have resulted to massive deforestation and consequential habitat loss all over the world. Scientists have estimated that human activities are likely to eliminate approximately 10 million species by the year 2050. The second reason for habitat biodiversity threats is the climate change. Due to the mindless and use of chemicals and fungicides by humans, the weather patterns have dramatically changed, causing rapid increase in water levels in our lakes and ocean all over the world. It is believed that if pollution and use of harmful substance won't stop, the world earth will continue facing hunger and drought due to decreased to decrease decreased import production and farm products. The third thing is poaching of wildlife. Poaching of wildlife for trade and commercial activities have been on the rise for the last many decades, hundreds of species have gone extinct and other left critically endangered. Illicit trading is driving many species of wild animals and plants to extinction. Extinction. Animals like ele okay, animals like uh, elephants in Africa are poached for ivory. Tiger and leopards are poached for their skins. Pangolins are poached for their meat and scales, which are believed to be treating people for aging, and rare timber is strangled for hardwood furniture. Other threats that include biodiversity are manual life conflict, destruction of wildlife, habitat, invasion of native species, decrease in wildlife population, and reduction in geographical ranges. Okay, as much as we speak the threats, we also have to speak about the conservation of biodiversity. And when considering the threats of biodiversity around the world and the vital importance of biodiversity for living beings, of which mankind is a major part, there is urgent need to conserve biodiversity in the world. We have two methods that can be used to conserve biodiversity. One is the in situ conservation. The in situ conservation on, on the site conservation is where conservation of species within their natural habitat, this is the most variable way of biodiversity conservation. It is the conservation of genetic resources through their maintenance within the environment in which they occur. For example, in national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, conservancies, biosphere reserves, and gene sanctuaries. The second method that you can use to conserve biodiversity is the ex situ conservation or the external mean of conservation where components of biological diversity outside their natural habitat. This method threatened all endangered species of animals and plants are taken out of their natural habitat and placed in a special settings where they can be protected and provided with natural growth. The in situ conservation method of plants and animals are taken away from their habitat and taken care in an artificial created way and of environment. For example, captivity breeding, gym banks, seed banks, zoos, botanical gardens, aquarias, in vitro fertilization, crypto preservation, tissue, and tissue culture. Thank you so much. 
thank you so much Mary uh, for speaking on the biodiversity uh, especially uh, today we celebrated the international biodiversity day and thank you for uh, speaking on the topic thank you so much and next i would like to call ceylon i think pronunciation is like that ceylon right hello hello everyone yes hello please Go hello ahead. good afternoon good afternoon from nigeria can we all hear me please ah uh, yes uh, we can hear you as long thank you all right okay so um, i'll be speaking on um, the sdgs especially the sdg4 which is the quality education and of course SG, SG, SG3 also I'll be speaking about that and so I'm so happy I'm so grateful for today so as we all know the rise of voice for nature be the voice of this generation so I have a few speeches to read to us which I made so I'm <clears throat> hoping that we can hear me very well before we go so and nature is so beautiful because I think it's governed by its fundamental principles. Nature will be extremely boring if it's only occupied by humans. Nature is boring without diversity. Nature is boring and frustrating without race. Nature is not beneficial without continents, countries, tribes, ethnicities, professional differences, and abilities to create, to recreate, and improve. Therefore, I celebrate all the products of nature at this conference across the nations of the world. Thank you. Nature has its way of grooming us with additional thorough furnishing. However, nature also has its way of getting our attention diverted from what we ought to rapidly pay attention to. This happens because I think nature loves to embrace things the way they are and not the way they really ought to be. Seven years ago, as a secondary school, um, as a senior secondary school student of the first level, my biology professor explains the basic information about the ecosystem to me. She listed the categories, which are the lithosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere, and the hydrosphere. I was confused because of the word sphere. The reason for my confusion was my familiarity with the word sphere, which I supposedly thought of it to be a connotation of shape from my knowledge of basic mathematics. I left for our office after the class to pour out my confused brain of the last 40 minutes to her in words. She laughed following my explanation, which sounded to her as if I was being narrative. My biology, my biology teacher took her time to explain to me the basic English language of what the words were in the context of the ecosystem. I understood after the explanation. How hilarious does that sound? The Echo Foundation, of course, is one of the result-oriented and effective bodies which originate from India, and it has been added over to uh, Mr. Jishu Panamoli and his precious wife to give to global youth leaders the platform to express themselves. So I would love to say a few things about my mom for my the concerning my education. Uh, my mom was... She is, and she will be the intellectual, the resilient, and the persevering woman who confidently believes in power of education. My mom strongly believes that there are platform education creates and give to learners for the expression of investment through educators and teachers, such as the biodiversity conference we're having today. My mom believes that when learners see themselves, there is the joy that flows in them. And so she doesn't allow us to stay at home when we were sick or troubled. My mom believes in 100% attendance in school. She believes in 100% engagement in school intra and extracurricular activities and 100% uh, attention with an eventuality of 100% positive result because she thinks we don't only pay school fees in schools, we also pay attention. I got to know of the 17 sustainable development goals listed by the United Nations early enough as far back as three years ago. My passion and focus are the SDG 4 and SDG 3, which is good health and well, which is quality education and good health and well-being respectively. 
I added to SDG4 by saying quality, equitable, inclusive, and transformative education. In 2020, I developed that passion after thorough engagements with more than 150 certified courses from different online campuses. Presently, I'm working on a book titled Different Methods, Same Answer in Quality and Transformative Education of Generations to Come in two volumes. I was inspired by the God of this nature to write this book and many other short notes about globalization. I began to develop myself on how to provide solutions to educational issues at the global level. After I got angry with one of my university classmates who didn't know the anatomical position description after three years of studying human anatomy, I didn't blame him at all, but I blamed the lecturers and the educators. Indeed, the famous saying, if education is expensive, try ignorance is true. Education makes a difference among the inhabitants of nature because I think what we know or what we are still trying to develop had been developed from nature. Nature will forever be nature. And the investment of the God of nature will forever be multiplying. We, we must know that nature will surely have force on everything. We cannot cheat nature at some point. Nature allows us to break records and set paces. Nature is wired to be in cycles, which is the renewal, the regeneration, and the recycling. Nature runs with time, and both of them refuse to expire. However, the product of nature expires when due. As global leaders, we should not always think of what we want to get from nature, but how to add to nature for, transgener for transgenerational empowerment. And that is why we have, and that is why we have um, different people advocating for the SDG. So one thing I will talk about um, for SDG 4 is in every country, because I'm very sure different people are listening from Nepal, from Indonesia, from India, from Malaysia, from Africa, Europe, I was trying to raise a campaign I call the Learning Impairment Campaign. Learning Impairment Campaign is simply a campaign whereby we, to, we as educators or we as global leaders, we try to figure out the difficulties that is making our learners to learn at a very faster pace. Because so many, so many educators, well, I've not been to other countries because I'm void of some experiences, but I think that education is progressive. However, we can never forget the basic status, the foundational level of education, because we are still going to give birth to more children. More children are still going to be given birth, and they need to understand what is two plus two. They need to understand what is one plus one. They need to understand the basic system of every profession that they find themselves into. So educators, wherever we are listening from, we should try and understand our students. Some of our students don't have the abilities to draw. Some of our students don't have the ability to read, to write. Some don't even have the ability to calculate. I've been, I've, I've been teaching for over three years, and I've seen students in such a way that my students are very brilliant. But when I give, it, when I give them a, a test, I say, okay, with the aid of a well labeled diagram, I want you to explain this particular structure. Somebody who does not know how to draw is going to fail my exam. But in my mind, I think, I, 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 I would think she doesn't know anything or she is dull. No. She isn't dull, but our own form of learning, our own passageway of learning, it's not drawing. So people that love to draw in my class will actually get the highest mark, but because he doesn't know, he doesn't have the ability to draw. Some students do not like writing exams. They prefer oral exams. So sometimes when I want to teach, I, I separate my students. So I will tell those that love to write, they should write. And those that want oral exams should come to my office and take the oral examinations. And everybody is going to pass. So educators should understand that learning impairment is very, very important because it soon make it soon make um, education go as far as we want. Yesterday, I think the boss, uh, Mr. Panamoli, um, is aware of um, we had a conference. I think I switched yesterday. I posted on my status, and we were speaking for we asked to speak for Cambodia. Do we have any Cambodian in the house? Anybody from Cambodia? So we we were we were we were asked to speak for the um, education, and we had a case. We had a case from Cambodia, and the case was ninety-seven percent of the students that were enrolled for the primary level of education they kept on failing. They realized that they realized that at level three, at grade three, this student couldn't write a single word. 
it is not actually it is not actually their fault so i was trying to i tried to explain to them yesterday that it is not the learner's fault it is not the educators are meant to educate educators are meant to impart knowledge we are meant to shape we are meant to bring out the genius of those students in every country, whether you're from Africa, you're from Asia, you're from um, America, we must understand that our student needs our help. Sometimes some students will tell sometimes some students will tell you that um, because I'm suffering from period poverty, that is why I can't come to school. Just because he or she cannot afford the mess trap had deprived her from coming to school, and eventually that child gets to fail. And where I'm from Nigeria, so sometimes I'll try, I'll, I'll try to give um, my experience in Nigeria. I'll try to give my experience in, in Nigeria because, and while I was in the university as an undergraduate student, sometimes I would fail a course, our lecturers are sometimes happy. They are, they are sometimes happy that, oh, they failed. But no, it shouldn't be like that. In, in a school, I expect um, the lecturer to be sad when you have mass failure of a course. When your student fails your course, you should be you should be sad because it is your it is your job. You are the one uh, you are the one in on the danger zone. You should be. Uh, what, what is the problem? Why my student not? Why are they not passing my course? Some of your students don't know. They may not even know how to draw. They may not even know how to calculate. And in this current world now, excuse me. In this current world now, I think at the basic level, all students should understand mathematics. But there are some students that really love to speak, they really love to write debates, essays, but they can't calculate. They find it difficult to calculate. For example, my mom. My mom is not a lover of mathematics. But at, 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 at least at a basic level, we should try. We should remember that anything that's going to happen to all our learners is actually on the platform of what to invest in them as educators. So from the learning impairment campaign, looking up to the learning environment, Looking up to the climate, there are some places, there are some locations where the climatic condition is so horrible that our students cannot, our students can't learn there. They can't get educated there. As sustainable development goals advocates, we should understand that all these goals are actually interconnected. For climate change advocates to be aware of what to do, they need to be educated. Gender equality needs to be educated. Industries, innovators, and industrialization advocates needs to be educated. Those who are responsible are, who are ready to work on life on land and life on water needs to be educated. Reduced inequalities needs to be educated. Decent work and economy needs to be educated. And other goals like that. So please, I'm, I'm so happy, I'm so grateful for this platform to share uh, what I know about because I think my own focus is the SDG. And I believe that we are going to be doing a greater work. We're going to be consulting our, our, our learners as educators, as teachers, whether you are virtually teaching or you're physically teaching in the school or in a class. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Siloan, uh, for your talk. And uh, you were talking on sustainable development number goal number four and the quality of education and the importance of the teachers in the society and uh, how a teacher should be and uh, how he should understand the students and all and uh, thank you so much and next i would like to call the rana earlier he had some technical issues and this time i will uh, share the slide for him rana are you ready yeah i'm ready and uh, i appreciate for I think this is the first slide, right? Uh, can you see okay. that? Um, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I can see. Yeah. Is everybody able to see? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you for sharing with us. Huh? 
So in the first slide, where is my personal my personal profile? In the course of time, I will not go through all the. Uh, maybe uh, I can just say I'm a student from Mount Kenya University, taking a Bachelor of Computer Science in IT. I'm also a mental health advocate, a founder of DOXA Foundation Runner Initiative, and I'm also a Rotaractor. Also a counseling psychology, and I'm also currently I'm in Lapid Leaders Africa, and also Africa Teule Leadership. Um, so I'm I'm so happy for this for uh, for this platform that you have uh, uh, appreciated great for us, especially the, the youth icons. So I'm so much happy. So with you, uh, I will go through a uh, certain research it's about a drought in one of uh, a country in Kenya called Marsabit. Uh, Marsabit is a is a is a country in in Kenya located in North, northern Kenya. And the situation in Marsabit country is desperate. Uh, people are walking as for as 40 kilometers in in search of food and water, as you can see the teachers there. And I, I, I found one of the mother with four who gave me this statement that I have been have not been able to with my children since this morning. Uh, the animals can no longer produce. Um, they are too weak. Even their children cannot be able to go to school. We we have we have only taken the little water that is uh, available and hoping to get food aid before the sun goes down. Again, I uh, said one of the mother from a, a, a word called Buga, Buga, Bugala, Bugala. So as you can see the pictures, this is what actually is happening in that area. There is a uh, extreme drought. People cannot even afford food. You can see the animals are so much weak. Okay, so about the area, Marsabit County has named a home globally as a gradle of mankind. Can't, um, the, 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 the country, the, the country is currently experiencing a huge suffering. And there is a very prolonged drought where over two, two there's supposed to be 2,000 200,000 people are bearing a bar of acute food and water shortage. Examples is a, a, a sub county called North Arab, where they have not been experiencing rain for at least two years. And now, no even uh, clouds, as you can see, the rare picture there one of the cradle. We have, um, you can see even um, animals, you can see the pictures there. So um, I've also go on uh, uh, doing my research on how families are struggling to feed themselves and also their livestock. Since no water, dry up of water, the pans and barren agricultural field are now uh, demanding women are forced to walk for several kilometers in search of water the little agricultural land is covered by dust with carcass across the ground livestock and humans they, they both drink water from the same foundation which uh is so much dangerous because sharing uh, water with animals can even accelerate uh, waterborne diseases. And also livestock and humans, uh, they, they, both, yeah, they drink both the water from the, the, the same foundation. Our families are also sharing little food with the animals 
and the food that they can afford is the boiled meals, which is which accelerate malnutrition. So you find out that that the food they only eat is the maize, and you can see uh, the, the lady here with a uh, with a small we call it sofuria in in Kenya, feeding uh, a, a camel. Just imagine how the situation is. So they they, they just leave them to keep them alive. You can also see another picture here, a camel and a, a, a man. I, I think it's a man here. They both are fetching water while the camel is drinking from the same foundation. And also, uh, this route has affected education. And I found out that many people are yet to return to class uh, as the third term has just started. And what caused that the, the low turnout is because of lack of food, no food in that place. Many children have turned to be full-time headers and they are now forced to travel many kilometers searching for pastures and water for their lives. So, uh, there's also a lack of facilities for study. As you can see the rural picture there, you can see uh, some children and you can also see lives. So um, about malnutrition, I found out that it is a high record. Several children under the age of five face moderate of severe malnutrition. And this is because of uh, no balanced diet. The only food they can afford is is the boiled maize. And I also found out that one can only eat once in a day. Just imagine having a, a just eat in a day. And if you get that war, you, they told me you were lucky. So uh, those people are suffering. They most of them eat the maize, which is which is a rate malnutrition. So I found out the mitigation and measures, um, distribution of food. The government and other corporates are distributing food for both animals and and people's uh, school feeding program, enhancement of integrated outreach programs in healthy facilities. We have also community sensitization of frustration. As you can see the pictures there, the first picture uh, in this case, portray, uh, indicate someone is fetching water, clean water. The other one, uh, the other one you can see uh, grass, for animals and also food for people. So uh, those people are suffering, those people are passing through so many challenges because of drought and it's still on. So, but the best thing is, uh, I found out that there are some corporates who are now going there to help them to do some food. Yeah, so that is my last presentation. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you so much, Rana, for your presentation uh, on how the climate change and followed by the climate disasters affect the life of the people, uh, as well as how the education of those uh, children is affecting due to the climate change and the drought over there. Uh, thank you so much. And next, I would like to call Chimp. Chimp. Yeah. Are you there, Chimp? Yeah. Are you able to get me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes, um, don't worry about the background. Um, I just wish that you are able to hear me clearly. Are you able to hear me clearly? Uh, yes, we can hear you. 
hear you properly no problem if there is some background noise is there it's fine but it's okay okay um i'm from zambia my name is chimfombe mutale and um i am a renewable engineer energy renewable engineer and um i am a proforestation activist and so i want to talk about uh, the importance of uh, waste to energy and how it affects our climate and also how we can use our waste to generate energy in a sustainable and efficient manner so looking at the causes of our health challenges in many of our african countries and also uh, most of our countries in the world you realize that waste has got a role to play and i say so because i've seen my neighbors i've seen my compound being affected by waterborne diseases which come from improper waste management and so this is because we don't have a ultimate solution to waste management i've seen our councils uh, and also the government fail to manage waste in my country because they don't have sustainable measures and sustainable measures put in place to combat waste and so my call is to realize that waste to energy is a key and waste to energy is indeed a goal that can help us to utilize our waste in a proper manner waste is not a problem but the management of it is what causes the problem waste in itself is money and if we put that in brackets that waste is money people will realize that waste should be utilized in order to generate income so i have devised a system that can uh, utilize waste and uh, make energy out of it with zero emissions and i feel this is possible in most countries and this is possible more especially to our african cities which are affected by waste and the utilization of waste as energy source can also be seen as a way in which we as individuals even at household levels can utilize that and also at national level we can utilize that there are other technologies that utilize waste to energy but the challenge is the recycling advocacy has said no to waste to energy but a further study is needed for the for the waste recyclers to understand that even waste to energy is a solution you realize that you cannot recycle 100% of waste there will be waste which will remain and so the core is that the waste that remains can be utilized for the generation of energy i am standing on it because i have the technical and the knowledge that waste to energy is not green washing some people might think waste to energy is green washing but i stand to say no to it because i have the technical knowledge of it and what i feel should be done is advocacy for it because the technology is there but people think that it is not the solution so my cry and my call is for many people to realize that waste to energy is indeed almost the ultimate solution to waste management challenges in our world and if you realize that if technologies that utilize waste to energy they become zero emitters and technology is there this will help us reduce the emissions in our atmosphere and another technology which can be added to waste to energy technology is the carbon capture and also carbon capture needs a further advocacy because some people also think it is just green washing but from my technological point of view carbon capture is the solution to help us reduce the heating up of the atmosphere and my goal is to advocate for carbon capture technology incorporated with waste to energy technology to help our our, our globe resolve the waste management challenges and the heating up of the atmosphere 
So I stand to advocate for waste to energy because it is the ultimate solution to waste management. And also it is a solution to climate change because when we look at the compounds and the communities where we are coming from, open air combustion is rampant. But if you place waste to energy technologies in these places, uh, that emissions that go direct into atmosphere will be combated. So on this day in which we cry out to the earth and say the waste to energy is not greenwashing, but is indeed a solution will indeed help us to realize and to put it into action. I would love to say thank you to the ECHO group and everyone and every team that has made this possible for us to gather in such a manner and discuss such important topics. I appreciate all the speakers before and the speakers that will come after me. And my call and my call is to say to each one of us to realize that technology is important to help us combat with climate and also to combat with waste challenges. So thank you very much. I really appreciate and I say for any waste to energy technologies, I will stand for it. And if any further information is needed, I am available. And not only me, other companies, which I also appreciate that are dealing with waste to energy solutions, I applaud them. Thank you very much. And may we cry out for a green and clean and healthy globe. Thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Shim. And uh, that was a really wonderful talk. And uh, as we know, we are making a lot of uh, waste every day. And uh, it is wonderful if we can make the waste into energy. And if we can use that for our energy needs, that will be really good. And uh, yeah, as you are working on the energy sector and uh, you are converting the waste into energy, that's also really great to know. And now I would like to call the uh, next participant uh, to speak and then Adrian. I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Adrian. I'm from Kenya. For today, I have seen so many people having different ideas about environment. So my call to everyone, the speakers, the people viewing from YouTube and people who will view this document. Stand, stand on your own to protect the environment. Today, I am an agriculturist. I have studied agriculture and community development. Today, I stand up to organic agriculture, where the crops, okay, the coverage of your land depends on each other. So with organic agriculture, we have forestry. We have, we have so many things to cover about organic agriculture. So today I can say I am a witness of organic products being healthy. I've been using organic products ever since I was young. I've been raised in a very fertile land, a land from Butler, where the soil is fertile and it's able to produce a lot. Seeing the previous years, like maybe comparing 10 years ago, the input we put in agriculture today and the input we used to put back then varies. Back then, we used to put little input and acquire a greater output since the soils were not damaged. Today, in organic agriculture, for example, <coughs> pardon, the use of synthetic drugs, when you use synthetic drugs, even the company itself knows that it's killing bacteria because they tell you, wash your hands thoroughly before taking food. So this is a poison. And we have important bacteria and harmful bacteria in the soil. So when you implement this chemical into the soil, you damage some important bacteria, which are important to the soil. 
So today, you have to, we are trying to neutralize the soils because some are acidic because of the fertilizer they are being used. Some are basic, yet not able to produce a good product, a good production. So I can stand here and say, everyone should, should motivate me and other organic farmers by consuming our, our products. Organic vegetable, organic livestock, organic cereals, because this will help us reduce diseases like cancer, diabetes, because today, People are, people are dying. Kenyans are dying countrywide. Worldwide, we see people are dying because of the type of food they are taking. So let's go back to organic agriculture. And one thing I know people fear about organic agriculture is the hard work. You have to work a lot. So we have, I took an initiative of approaching a group called Bukati Green Foundation, BGF. It's in Busia County, Butla sub-county, to embrace organic farming. We have been able to reach 20 farmers so far since the pandemic started, the corona pandemic started. And today we have seen people are the few samples that we took, the few people that we took are really appreciating the organic farming to the inorganic farming. They can say they have started seeing crops that they, they never seen before. Why? It's because this, their soil have started rehabilitating. So let's stop damaging the soil for the future use our kids will suffer. The younger generation, the middle generation will suffer too, knowing that you have to own a big land, which is nowhere in Kenya today. At least one person can be able to have, at least one adult can be able to handle at least a quarter an acre, which is, which is enough for for the person, or maybe even a third, a third an acre is enough for everyone, for every single person. Today, we have so many activities taking place that damages the agriculture. I've only talked about agrochemical because it is what is really affecting agriculture. But we have other things like industrialization, the trailers, because Busia is in, on the boundary of Uganda and Kenya, so we have a lot of trailers emitting a lot of gases, damaging the ozone layer. Thank you for this opportunity. I also want to thank the person that shared the link to me. I also appreciate the organizers. I also, I also appreciate all the consumers of organic products and everyone participating in this in this event thank you okay thank you so much and uh, thank you so much for your speak on the agriculture and how should a sustainable agriculture should be and uh, the importance of uh, coming back to the uh, use of the uh, fertilizers which is more sustainable for the nature and um, i think uh, for today we are nearly finished with the live speakers uh, but i have two videos from the speakers they requested me to share this video in the session and i will share that video right now for you
Hello everyone, this is Niveta here from India. I'm currently posting my bachelor's degree final year in XCCE. Here my topic is on sustainable development goals. The world today prospers from the fruits of a global economic growth. At the same time, it shares the fear of massive environmental degradation. Human activity has led to very real dangers such as climate change, desertification, water stress, ecosystem degradation, etc. We are approaching the tipping point, our planet boundaries, which once passed will be risk irreversible and abrupt environmental changes. In addition, the fruits of the economic growth are far from being shared widely. We see the highly unequal distribution of income both within countries and between countries. While billions of people thrive with increased longevity and higher level of well-being, the poorest of the poorest continue to suffer daily for the survival, lack of basic skills of nutrition, health care, shelter and sanitization. Coming to the history, although sustainable development is now a shared and defining concept in our times, there were important steps taken throughout history to make this possible like thinking about environmental concerns as a national issue, acknowledging that our development objectives today must not neglect the need of the future, understanding the critical balance between the integrated and interdependent spheres of environment, society and economy. At the turn of the century in September 2000, Leaders of 189 countries gathered at UN headquarters in Newark and signed the historic Millennium Declaration. This established a global partnership of countries and development partners committed to achieving a set of eight voluntary development goals called Millennium Development Goals by the target date of 2015. On 1st January 2016, Sustainable Development Goals of 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development officially came into force. Over the next 15 years with these new goals that universally apply to all countries will mobilize the effort to the end to all the form of poverty, fight inequalities and to tackle climate changes while ensuring that no one is left behind. While Millennium Development Goals in theory applied to all countries, in reality they were geared towards the target for developing countries. Sustainable Development Goals are significant in that they are much more inclusive. That is, they call for action by all countries, poor, rich and middle income countries to promote prosperity while protecting the planet. For this reason, Sustainable Development Goal allow for the degree of flexibility to speak to different national circumstances. They include a global dashboard of targets and indicators under each goal from which the countries can select the most appropriate and relevant one. While Millennium Development Goals provide a valuable model for development, there is a broad agreement that they were too narrow. Sustainable Development Goals go much further than Millennium Development Goals in that they are more comprehensive. The 17 goals aim to address the root causes of poverty, recognizing that ending poverty must go hand in hand with strategies which build economic growth and address a range of social needs, including health, education, social protection, job opportunities while tackling climate change and environmental protection. By concluding, when it comes to sustainable development, all country is a developing country. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you uh, for her talk and we have one more talk and I will share that one too.
welcome to the presentation on impacts of sea turtle conservation in india so these are the following contents to be covered during the session so we know that sea turtles are regarded as air breathing reptiles charismatic large fascinating oviparous and flagship species for the diverse habitats they occupy they are very important as a top predator it plays a vital role in balancing the ecological health and economic wealth of the marine ecosystem so they inhabit tropical and subtropical seas around the world from eocene to pleiocene between 60 to 10 million years ago so the taxonomy which reveals two families that is chelonidae which constitutes six species and demochelidae of one species globally for indian concern we have five species are known to occur mainly along the indian coast and they are also predominantly found in gahir mata baitar kanika and rishikuli estuaries in odisha and gulf of mannar and pak bay coast of tamil nadu so the key for identification which reveals or identified based on the number of coastal scutes prefrontal scales on the head and inframarginal pores so the life cycle of sea turtle reproduction reveals after mating the turtles will back to the natal beach for laying eggs after laying it took 6 to 7 weeks then the releasing of hatched out young ones to the sea the prey predator relationship reveals both natural as well as anthropogenic activities which threatens the turtle like fishing and developmental activities etc so as we know that utilization of turtle resources are prohibited which shows the importance of nesting distribution pattern along the coast of india so basically threats are divided into two which is of direct and indirect direct which reveals under fishery related mortality consumption of adults hunting poaching and egg predation so indirect is related to marine habitat loss pollution lighting and loss of nesting beaches and, and other, other developmental development activities so these are all some production measures globally and indian concern which reveals that the strict rules and regulations to be enforced or it has to be addressed properly for the effective management and conservation of turtle resources so these are all some ex situ conservation measures or conservation status in tamil nadu which has been followed hatchery management and periodic reviewing of coastal developmental projects production of nesting sites with specific to all over at least appointing turtle guards intensive awareness program among the stakeholders along the coast and identification of tracks for the accurate nesting site management and satellite tracking studies on turtle to study the migratory pattern of this ambassador species so these are all some of the following recommendations which has been discussed for the effective management the future scope 
will be the proper identification of sea turtles, tracking of turtles based on geospatial technology, applications of remote sensing. So I would like to conclude there is a need for effective management and the issue has to be properly addressed. For the holistic marine conservation of these ecological wealth and health. Thank you. And thank you so much for that one. And now I would like to call the last speaker of the session, and that is Arpit. I think yeah, mm, Arth Arth Gupta. Arth Arth Gupta. Are you there? I think he will join now with us. I think he will join now. Please wait for a second. And in the last two days, we had nearly 20 25 speakers from the world, uh, like uh, nearly 15 country people or speakers participated in our event. And uh, it was great, uh, great to meet all those young speakers across the world. And we, Equa Foundations, and some other uh, youth NGOs organized this event um, to celebrate the World uh, International Biodiversity Day. And uh, yeah. Anyway, the event was successful in a way like uh, we got nearly 75 registered speakers, but unfortunately only 25 were able to join. But uh, in any, as like in any event, uh, nearly 30 percentage of uh, speakers joined and speak uh, about the concerns on environment and climate change. Uh, that's really good. And uh, we will conduct such events to uh, give opportunity to the younger uh, people uh, to speak on their concerns on environment and climate change and i think uh, arth is the la uh, arth is the last uh, speaker and he is here now and arth uh, you can you are one of the youngest uh, speakers in this uh, event now it's to, uh, the mic is to you arth thank you sir greetings everyone i am arth gupta a youth ambassador for unacc and today i will be talking about uh, i will be talking a little about sustainable development goals or SDGs. SDGs were set up in 2015 by the UN General Assembly and these are a collection of 17 interlinked global goals which have been designed to be a blueprint for us as humans to achieve a better and more sustainable future for everyone. For sustainable development to be achieved, it is crucial to harmonize three core elements, economic growth, social inclusion and environmental protection. These elements are interconnected and are all crucial for the well-being of individuals and societies. These 17 SDGs to transform our world are as follows. Goal number one, poverty, no poverty. Goal number two, zero hunger. Number three, good health and well-being. Number four, quality education. Number five, gender equality. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Number seven, affordable and clean energy. Number eight, 
decent work and economic growth number 9 industry innovation and infrastructure number 10 reduced inequality for all number 11 sustainable cities and communities number 12 responsible consumption and production number 13 climate action number 14 life below water number 15 life on land number 16 peace and justice strong institutions and last but not least partnerships to achieve the goal these are important as they help us to work towards an equal and impartial society for all and they promote a long term approach to addressing global challenges that are not typically addressed by some countries but are faced and require joint action for all most government programs have a rather short life span of about 4 to 5 years and the sustainability of these programs is often challenged by changes for example a government may be impeached or the term for a government may be over so a new government will come and they might discontinue the plan which had been set up so the sdgs set a target for the next 15 years which means that even though the government which is in power now may not be in power in 2030 but since these have been set up as a global goal they will be uh, followed and these act as a long term agenda and target which have been agreed upon by 193 countries which promotes sustainability of actions and reinforces the commitment of states regarding regardless of changes in the national political context if these goals are followed we will be able to live in a better place and the world will turn into a impartial world for all thank you and uh, thank you so much uh, earth actually so many people discuss on the same topic uh, earlier uh, then uh, it was really good to uh, speak again and recalling us on sustainable development goal thank you so much and i believe uh, no other speakers are here mm, so we will wind up the sessions and if uh, anyone uh, in the list is here then please let me know then i will call them as well if anyone in the uh, list of day 2 is available here please let me know yes i am here my number is slot number is 39 oh, okay thank you so much for joining me this today and uh, you can speak thank you thank you in this session i will talk about snake snake bite snake management do's and don'ts after snake Actually, the snake is a neglected animal. Every year, six to seven thousand people are dying due to snake bites in Bangladesh. It's number in more in the whole world. One of the reasons for the fear of snakes: the snake does not actually bite. If snakes are not around or injured for any reason, they avoid human contact. Non-venomous snakes are not a threat to humans, but non-venomous snakes are not harmful to humans. as their teeth are basically like gripping and holding something when rainwater enters a hole in the ground snakes come out to survive and can bite animals or humans symptoms of venomous snake bite including vomiting dizziness swelling at the bite site decreased blood pressure double vision in the eyes numbness of neck muscles and tightening of the neck backwards in this case the patient should be admitted to the hospital immediately the affected area can't be moved before being taken to the hospital he should not be allowed to eat any kind of food actually lots of people did this mistake when someone is bitten by a snake they try to give him some food or drinks or anything but it should be forbidden to give them any kind of food if he wants to sleep he have to be keep working if he eyes fall down when hand or foot is biting actually there is lots of time we see hand or foot is bitten a wooden or bamboo mat or some hard object should be placed on the back of the hand to make a splint with the each of the sari or clean cloth basically it should be clean cloth it's it's totally safe for the bitten patient the affected area should be covered with cloth remember you can tie to tight if you make the tie too tight then blood supply may be disrupted 
and gangrene may occur. Take the snake beaten patient to the nearest hospital for scientific and modern treatment without showing him Ojha Vodhu or Kobes. Actually, when someone is bitten, people try to give people try to ointment um, as quack doctor or kapiraj, but it should be forbidden. Again, do not apply raw egg, slime, or dung on the affected area. In our subcontinent country, people used to use dung or raw eggs, lime, etc. But it should not be used on the affected area. This can lead to infection and loss of the life of the patient. Again, you have to know the details about snakes. You also need to be a clear idea of what to do when and what should not do. This is all. Okay, thank you so much uh, for giving us knowledge on the snakes. And next, I would like to call the Clarice. Solomon from Cameroon. Thank you. Thank you. Clarice, are you there? Hello, Clarice. Hello. I think Clarice is not available here uh, with us today, uh, but it's fine. Anyway, uh, we would like to uh, conclude our sessions, and we were organizing this event for uh, last uh, two days. Yes, yes, Clarice, uh, Clarice. If you are available, then please go ahead. Uh, I think uh, you need to unmute, uh, unmute yourself. Class, I can't unmute you. Uh, you can do that yourself. Hello. Ah, uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me, please? Ah, uh, yes, we can hear you. You can start your session. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's my pleasure to be part of this uh, mastermind group. I'm Solomon uh, Taribo Tato from Cameroon, the uh, CEO of uh, Tamayok Foundation and uh, an epidemiologist and uh, also um, a member of the UNEP uh, focal point group. So uh, actually, uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this uh, World Di uh, Biodiversity Day as one of the speakers. I just want to outline uh, a few points that uh, we are facing today in the, the world. Actually, I'm an activist of uh, water and uh, SDG number six, that is water, and SDG number 13, that is uh, climate action. So uh, I just have a message to raise my voice as one of the activists. Uh, crisis facing humanity. That involves a climate crisis, nature crisis, pollution crisis. So, and... Uh, an alarm has been sounded for us to restore the biodiversity and the ecosystem. So uh, loss of biodiversity and the ecosystem integrity together with climate change and pollution will undermine our efforts on 80% assessed on the SDG goals. So uh, 
target making it ever more difficult to report progress on poverty reduction, hunger, health, water crisis and climate. So we need to look further than the global pandemic caused by the COVID-19, which is a zoonotic disease. That has to say transmitted from an animal to the human to know that the fairly tuned system of the natural world has been disrupted. And finally, the toxic trail of economic growth, pollution and waste, which resolve every year in the premature death of millions of people across the world. So to repair our climate entails the transformation actions that can be unleashed human inequity and cooperation to secure livelihood and well-being for all. So the repair means solution that recognizes the interconnected. Also repair means shifting our values, worldviews, as well as our financial and economic system. So um, when we talk about water, which is one of the fundamentals of our human life, okay. about 2.2 billion people are living without access to safe water. That is why the United Nations in 1993 had to introduce the observance of World Water Day. And uh, the, the, the significance of this day is for the focusing of the importance of clean water. World Water Day celebrates water, raises awareness of the two billion people living without access to safe water. It is about taking action to tackle the global water crisis. A core focus of Water Day is to support the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals number six, and uh, which the, on, the, on the World Water Day itself, the United Nations Water Development Report is released, focusing on some of the topics as the campaign and recommending policy direction to decision makers. Groundwater is a vital source that provides almost half of all drinking water worldwide. About 40% of irrigated agriculture and about one third of water required for industry. It sustains ecosystems, maintains the base flow of rivers and prevent land subsidence and seawater intrusion. Groundwater is an important part of climate change adaptation process and is often a solution for people without access to safe water. Despite these impressive facts and figures, invisible groundwater is out of sight and out of mind for most people. Human activities, including population and economic growth and climate variability are rapidly increasing. The pressure on groundwater resources Serious depletion and pollution problems are reported for many parts of the world. For example, in my country, like in Cameroon, we are also we are facing a lot of uh, climate impact. You know, if you look at Cameroon critically, Cameroon fall along the equatorial forest. Now they are experiencing heavy rainfall with violent winds, and which is already causing a lot of disasters because of the pollution of the gutters. So we, went to, we have to raise awareness for the, the youths and the women, children, for them to, to know how to prevent pollutions. Like, for example, we have introduced uh, plastic recycling, such that the plastic that have not been, are not been, that have been used should be deposited in a bin so that they can recycle them to avoid pollution because most of the floods that have been caused now due to heavy rainfall is because of the gutters have been blocked, the rivers and the seas have been polluted with plastic waste.
So we have to create awareness for the population, the local community to be aware and to know that the impact well that we'll be facing in the, the, in the future will be so devastating. So at this moment, we have to raise our voice for the, for, to ensure the awareness of the climate change. Because if you go to some suburb, to some primary schools, people will be complaining, there's no water. The, the temperature is very high, but they don't know that they, they are so ignorant about the fact that it is because of the climate change. So now we are introducing greening cities in the communities, the planting of trees in the communities that can reduce carbon in the atmosphere. And also to introduce the recycling of plastic waste that can reduce pollution in the gutters that will cause floods such that we can achieve our SDG goals by 2035. Thank you very much for the participating and for giving me this opportunity to be one of the members. Thank you once more, ECHO Foundation. Thank you, members, and I uh, wish everybody uh, a long life so that we can tackle this biodiversity impact that is we are facing in the world thank you very much okay thank you very much clarice and uh, i think we need to wind up our solomon. Session. solomon uh, speaking uh solomon solomon uh, yeah solomon yeah solomon thank you so much solomon uh for your talk and that was a really nice talk and uh, i think today we need to wind up our sessions and this is the last day of our event and we were organizing this event uh for last two days like um, 21 and 22 and uh we got we had nearly 80 registered speakers but uh, unfortunately um, we have a less number uh, compared to the registration number but uh, 2028 20, uh, speakers already speak in our event and that's really a good number with a great diversity like we have nearly 15 plus country uh, speakers were there and actually the major motto behind the event is to raise the voice of the young people and uh, most of the young generation is not getting a platform proper platform to raise their voice and through this event we are giving them a chance to speak and raise their voice and actually this is a uh, part of our um, youth ca uh, youth capacity building uh, program initiative and then thank you so much everyone for joining and the certificate will be issued within a week for both participants and uh, participants and the speakers mm -hmm. and um, not for every registered speakers and only to those speakers who uh, speak here will get the certificate as well as for the regis uh, registered participants they will get the certificates too and thank you so much for joining us and make the event a great success and thank you so much everyone for uh, being patient and join throughout the event thank you and we are uh, we will come up with some other events for uh, you especially to raise your voice thank you thank you all bye bye take care thank Good you night. very much thanks everyone have a night. nice day bye thank you director for giving the opportunity uh, to involve in this event Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you.